Hello, everybody. Breaking Bread, Wednesday, February the 28th, and we're about ready to march right into March. I uh, just appreciate everybody being here today. Looks like we have a pretty full house. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you for Marty providing the interesting scenery in the background. Uh, always something fun to look at visually. I had uh, several prayer requests that I need to remind you about this week. Uh, again, as I mentioned, please pray for Donna this week. Please pray for Bill and Dot. I did speak with Lee. Lee has uh, some family coming into town, so he's not able to join us for a good reason. Uh, Dot continues to improve, but as you know, that situation is uh, delicate with her heart, so just continue to pray for her recovery and her strength. Bill is still in cardiac rehab <clears throat> every Wednesday. So he won't be joining us for a while until he's through that process. Bill also has a very tenuous situation. He's got a, a blocked artery, but they really can't get to it. It's a high risk procedure. So just pray that God would unblock that artery on Bill progressively and naturally without needing surgery. Um, my buddy, Tim down the street, who's still, uh, battling cancer. He is done with his radiation. I think he has another uh, 10 days and then he begins the chemo portion. So if you guys could remember Tim, that's going to be kind of rough when he starts to go through because he's just now starting to feel more normal from the radiation and getting back. But now he has to go do the, the chemo portion and that portion will have to last months. So please remember my buddy uh, Tim. And uh, that's all I had sent to me for this week. Um, and then I'm just going to pick on somebody. Dana, would you mind opening this up in prayer? You have to take yourself off mute. I appreciate it. No. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you that you are on the throne and you're still in charge. Lord, no, we're not. So, Lord, we look towards you as, as we should do every day, every moment. You heard our prayer requests, and you know them now. Lord, we just pray that these people will rest in your peace as you do your work that only you can do. And for us, Lord, as we're listening and those who may be watching later, we look towards you, Lord, to speak to us through your word by the power of the Holy Spirit, using Lynn as a tool, Lord. Speak through him and give him the words that you want him to say that we need to hear. And Lord, our hearts are open. Our hearts are ready. And to, and to hear to what you want to speak to us today. So we commit this time to you, Lord. And everybody said, amen. Amen. All right, guys, flip yourselves over on mute. Thank you, Dana, very much. And if you will turn with me to John chapter 11, John chapter 11, I'm going to give you a preface. I don't know if this is going to be two minutes or 10 minutes. We're going to see how the spirit leads on this. Um. I rarely give you an application to begin a chapter. Normally I read something first, but as we go through the story in chapter 11, it's probably going to take us uh, two weeks or so to get through this. Um, it, it's the story of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and, and Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Now we are all pretty familiar with this story. We're, we're all accustomed to this story. Um, and, but here's what I kind of want you to think about as we, as kind of like this overriding layer, as we go through this week and next week, I want you to think about this aspect. Jesus loved them and they love Jesus. And that, that's never in doubt. As a matter of fact, outside the circle of the disciples, these were like his close friends and his disciples were around him because they they were, they, they were there for a purpose, but they generally, genu genuinely were his friends, Mary, Martha, Lazarus. All the mentions that we see about them, I, I don't know, do you guys have um, in your life someone that you consider to be your best friend? All right, I get a couple of nods. And your best friend, whoever that person is, do they not feel close to you just sometimes than your own siblings, your own brother, your own sister? Do you know what I'm talking about? That's Lazarus. That's Mary. That's Martha. They were really tight 
with Jesus. And Jesus enjoyed their hospitality. He enjoyed their friendship. He loved them. They loved him back. But I want you to just think about this. Despite that, despite their linkage with him, despite their relationship to, the, to Jesus, in no way did this insulate them from difficulty. In no way did this immunize them from hardship and from tragedy. So before we start going into chapter 11, I'm going to talk about a topic that's really uh, hard because the Bible, when I teach it, sometimes it forces me to talk about stuff that I'm not terribly comfortable talking about. Um, you step on people's toes, you hurt people's feelings. That's never my intent. Um, many people feel very strongly about this topic and have very widely differing opinions on it. So uh, as Paul Harvey would say, this is my opinion. This is my commentary because frankly, this is my broadcast. Okay, here we go. Um, that was supposed to be a joke. Um, I don't, uh, probably one of the most controversial things for believers to talk about is this topic about prayer, sickness, and trusting God. And we're gonna see this played out in chapter 11. And all those attributes are played out. And it leaves you with a lot of questions and unfortunately not a lot of answers. Um, we are clearly a broken species living in a broken world that also clearly we broke. God could at any moment change that. We're told in scripture that one day he will change that. But for now, he leaves it broken. And because of that, people get old, people get sick. People suffer and people die. Children and little innocent grandmothers and sweet little moms. And you come up with every scenario. It's been done. It's been seen. It's been experienced. And it just doesn't feel right. And let me tell you, it's because it isn't right. And God never designed this world to be this way. But it is now that way because we broke it. And one day he'll fix it. But for now, this is what we are all corporately living in, this broken world. So how does prayer come into this? How, how do we, what do we do with this? If, if God loves us and my loved one is sick and I ask God, God, please take away this sickness. We, we start breaking bread every week with prayer requests and they're usually about physical ailments. It's just part and parcel of our lives. And especially as our crowd here and breaking bread, the, at least the live version gets older. This is becoming more and more prevalent every week on our broadcasts. This is part of our life. Now, on one hand, we're compelled to pray because we love these people that are in our lives that God has put in our lives and we see them suffering and we don't want them to suffer. So we feel compelled to pray. But we're also, let me make it clear, we're instructed also to pray. We're commanded to pray. So what do we pray? As I've told you here on Breaking Bread many, 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 so many times I can't even begin to recount that I always pray the best. When I pray, I know that whatever I'm asking for um, I pray it the best way that I perceive it to be, which is going to be that that person is healed. If that's what the situation is or their financial calamity ends or fill in the blanks, but I pray the best the way I see it. But I also know that I am praying in absolute and total ignorance of the big picture. Only God has the big picture. This will come out in the story and I'll bring it up again just shortly. But can you imagine, Jim, I just want you to imagine for a second that door that's right behind you that probably leads to a hallway outside of your study. During the course of this teaching, somebody went and fetched Mary and Martha in a time machine and brought them and they're going to walk in that doorway right behind you. And they're going to see this screen and they're not going to understand anything that they're seeing. But the one thing they understand that's happening 
is that their brother's death and resurrection is still being spoken about today. Thousands of years later, this story is still bringing glory to God to this day. Now, do you think they ever comprehended that that was a possibility? No matter the outcome, guys, I know I'm praying in ignorance. I'm praying for the person to be healed. I'm praying full well knowing that I don't know all the ins or outs, the beginning or the end. I don't know any of that, but I do know that God does. And I know that God is all powerful and that it's not a matter of can he heal them. It's a matter of only if he will heal them. I know that he knows the best in all scenarios. It, it, it's like a, a seven dimensional Vulcan chess game. He can see every move and every repercussion it's going to have, not only in your generation, but as in the case of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, 2,000 years later, it's having this, it's having repercussions. So I know God is ultimately good, and he wouldn't choose a difficult path out of some perverse pleasure that he derives from it. He wouldn't choose that you walk a harsh moment unless it were absolutely necessary to some bigger plan or some bigger good. Now, the world looks at me and how I pray and how I reconcile all this and said, that's nothing more than just rationalization. Well, if it isn't true, then they're right. That's all this is, is just rationalization. The whole concept of prayer and trusting in an infinite God, if it isn't true, it's just, it's just mind games to, 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 to get myself through this life. And when we die, there's nothing. But if it is true, if it is true, if there is an all-knowing, all-seeing, all-present, all-powerful God who is nothing but pure good and has no speck of evil in him, then everything that I said can be trusted and is true. You can pray what you perceive to be the best outcome and no matter what happens, if the answer is no, you can trust that God will bring good from it. If the answer, how can he bring good this little baby? He'll bring good of it. If the answer is yes, we sing his praises and we come next week and report of the healing. And it all encourages us in our walk with him. If the answer is wait, not yet. It forces us to continue to go back to him. But we are commanded to pray, not just because we're compelled emotionally, but because God says it's good for us to come to him with our needs. And he knows that we don't know the best outcome. He knows we're going to pray like Martha blurts out today as we go into. She's just going to what she perceives to be the best. And, and it's okay. It's okay to be honest with God. It's okay to pray wrongly sometimes to God. Wrongly in that you don't have all the answers. So is that wrong? Yeah, it's wrong. Technically, it's wrong. But that pleases God that you come to him even in your ignorance and ask for his help. So guys, this is why we pray. And I think hardship and sickness and death will be a partner with all of us. And as we age, it will be a frequent partner. Your friends, your family members will, will die. One day you will die. And we're all going to get sicker and sicker and sicker. And more and more things are going to break on us. And the list just seems to go on and on. But this is the life that we are called to. And he walks with us in that life. And he's always there with us and always welcomes our prayers. So with that as the preface, now go to verse one through three as we study the story of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So we clearly identify, there's a lot of Marys in the Bible. We clearly identify which Mary this is. Therefore, the sister sent to him, Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. 
Now, remember last time we spoke, Jesus is nowhere near Bethlehem. He, he pulled away from Bethlehem, went to an area where uh, uh, Herod and Tippus lived. So the Jews had no direct authority because they tried to kill him. The Jews tried to kill Jesus. So he's over there. He's about 20 miles, frankly. He's in a, a region called Perea and a, and a town called Bethabara is where he's at. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. So they sent for him. And, and all they said to him was, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Now, this is probably one of the most remarkable stories that we will cover in the gospel of John. Um, now, some might say it's wrong to think one miracle is more difficult than another miracle. And I get that from God's perspective. No miracle is difficult, okay? From the smallest to the greatest, they're all easy for God. That's not an issue. It's from a human perspective, this is probably one of the greatest miracles that we are told of in God's, John's gospel. It's also, as we talk about the seven signs or the seven miracles, uh, this is the seventh miracle of Jesus in the gospel of John. And it's very unique. Where's this happening at? Bethany is not in Jerusalem. It's about two miles outside of Jerusalem on the road to Jericho. There's this little tiny village called Bethany. Um, it was near enough to Jerusalem so that people came from Jer Jerusalem to Mary and Martha's aid to comfort them and so forth. It was far enough away to where hopefully it wouldn't draw direct attention from the Jewish leadership towards Jesus. Now, this account is only in the Gospel of John. I find that very interesting. The synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, do not have this most amazing story of a man being raised from the dead. Now, there's a lot of theories out there about why that is. I don't think we actually know the exact one, which one is correct. One of those I'll just mention is that Peter who heavily influenced the writing of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Peter was not present here in this story of Lazarus. Uh, Peter actually at this time was in Galilee uh, and Jesus is up in this area of Perea, uh, Bethabara, and he's headed to Bethany about 20 miles away. So that could be the reason is because Peter wasn't there. And John was, so John wrote about this and Peter didn't because he wasn't present. That's one, one theory. Now, Jesus, it talks about Lazarus and Martha and Mary. He had a close relationship with his family. Um, when Lazarus uh, gets sick, by the way, Lazarus' name means something. It means God is my help. I think that is uh, highly appropriate based on what's happening to him. He was sick. And so it's natural for the sisters to, to make Jesus aware of their needs. So they sent a messenger to Jesus saying, the one you love is sick. Um, and, and you can imagine what they were thinking. I got to let Ned back in. You imagine what they were thinking that, you know, they've seen Jesus heal plenty of others. So um, he's going to meet their need also. And they, they, they give an important message. They say, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now, they didn't specifically ask. It's probably going to be our first application, which ties in with my intro. They didn't ask Jesus to come and heal Lazarus. Notice that? They just made him aware of the situation. They feel like they didn't need to tell him what to do. They just simply told him what the problem was. And then they're going to let Jesus decide what's appropriate to do. Now, I'm not going to go into pet peeves and all, but this is, this is something I hear people doing in prayer. And like I said, I'm not critiquing people's prayers. I pray in ignorance myself because I pray for the best outcome. I pray for the people to be healed or that person to be saved. I don't know God's will on that topic. I just pray from my ignorance what I perceive to be the best. But 
so often we hear people pray, uh, basically commanding and demanding that Jesus heal somebody. And I've heard, I know you've heard they, they, they say, I'm going to speak it into existence and they're going to tell God what to do. And I think that's, that's a very problematic position to take. I think that God is sovereign and you need to respect God's sovereignty in any given situation. Now, does he get ticked off and write you off because you prayed in the, with a demanding tone? No, no, but I don't believe that is the way we're to approach God. I believe the way that Mary and Martha approach God and why it's given to us as an example in this story is we need to trust God with what the best thing is. Now, you're going to see in a second, they don't do this perfectly. They're human beings. They love their brother and, and emotion gets the better of them like it would with any of us. Um, so they send this message to Jesus 20 miles away in a town called Bethabara that the one you loved was sick. Now, John Corson wrote on this particular phrase, the one you love is sick. And I'd like to read you, it's just a paragraph. He says, like Mary and Martha, I don't approach the Lord on the basis of my love for him. You know why? Because my love for the Lord is fickle and feeble. But his love for me, however, is fixed and firm. It's infinite and it's eternal. God is never surprised by what I say. He's never taken aback by what I do. Therefore, wise is the man or woman who approaches the Lord based on his love and not yours. You're going to hear this theme over and over again as we go through uh, chapter 11. It is all about God. Any premise that you begin to take up where something hinges all on you, then your focus is wrong. I'm sorry. You need to suspect anything, any approach, any theology, any religion, any practice, which places the importance upon you. Because if one thing the Bible teaches over and over and over again is it is all about him and not about you. Okay. Yes, he loves you. Yes, he died on a cross so that you could be with him. This is all true. But don't get your Mr. Fancy Pants on. The story is not about you. It is always about God. Are you guys with me on that? Okay. Go to verse 4 through 6. When Jesus heard that from this messenger, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. What? That's when you hear that record go scratch. What? Doesn't make sense. He said to those who were around him, the disciples that were around him, the sickness is not unto death. Now, I, I find a couple things fascinating about that statement. Number one, Jesus knew what the end result was going to be. And it's not death. He knew the end result of what's going to happen is going to be God's glory. He also knew that what he's about to do with Lazarus is going to be the final tipping point to inflame the religious leaders and be the last straw that's broken that will ultimately lead to his persecution and death at the hands of the religious leaders. But even that he knew the end result of his death would be his resurrection and the glorification of himself and of his father. Now listen, the same statement that they made about Lazarus in this particular circumstance that Jesus used could be made to about every one of you believers. Listen to me. Death and sickness are not our final outcome. Life is. Okay? When we're facing it, and we'll all face it, when we're facing it, and it's going to be hard, and it's going to be scary, 
And there'll be those moments of doubt. And there'll be those moments of panic. As we're struggling to breathe, as we're struggling to listen, it's not, death is not the end for any of us. That's not our final outcome. Remember this. This sickness is not unto death. This sickness is not unto death. Life is the outcome, not death. Now, a couple of quotes here, one from Alfred and one from Spurgeon. The only right understanding of this answer and our Lord's whole proceeding here is that he knew and foresaw all from the first. So Jesus had foreknowledge on this point. And Spurgeon wrote, the Lord speaks of things not as they seem to be, nor even as they are in the present, but rather as they shall be. So Jesus gives this little nugget that I hope is encouraging to all of us as we approach that ultimate outcome for us. He said, this is not unto death, but it's rather for the glory of God. And this is the point I alluded to using Jim and Rachel with Mary and Martha coming in through that door right behind them. This story is still being told thousands of years later. What would they think about that? My, my application to you, what I want you to remember is listen to me, whoever you are, whenever you're listening to this, it could be 10 years from now on some random accidental thing that you clicked on this YouTube channel. Your life is not an accident. None of your lives are accidents. You're not a mistake. God made you on purpose. He made you special. He loves you. And your life will give glory to God way beyond your lifetime. Think of the impacts that you have on someone today that you hardly knew, but you made an impact on their life. And then they do something and they do something and their grandkids and their grandkids. And 400 years from now, people are getting saved because of something you did. Now, maybe it's not written up in a book, but if you'd like, Paul knows I can make you a story that will show you how how incredible the footprint that you're making. Your life is not insignificant. Your life has purpose. You are special. You're not an accident. And please take encouragement from what's happening to Mary and, and Martha and Lazarus. They didn't write a book of the Bible. They didn't come up with some phenomenal theological point. They were participants and characters in a story and they loved Jesus. And we still tell this story today. John reminds us that Jesus genuinely loved them. This is, this is important to remember because he's testing their faith. But this doesn't mean that he doesn't love them. And does it ever feel that way? Have you ever prayed for something really passionately to God, something that you can't understand why he would not answer this because the answer to this would only bring him glory and saying no only does not bring him glory. Why would he not answer this? Just understand when the answer is no, it doesn't mean he doesn't love you. It means you don't have all the pieces and he does. So remember this. Remember this, when hard times come, not if they come, when they come. Jesus still loves you, even when he allows bad things to happen to you in your life. Don't get mad at him like a lot of people do and shake your fist at him like a lot of people do throughout history when bad things happen. Understand that he still loves you, even though he allowed something bad to happen. It's very hard. It ties in with my opening statement. So he stayed two more days. Now, can you imagine being the disciples and they hear this and they know Jesus loves Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And then he intentionally states, we're going to we're going to hang around for a couple more days. You don't think that baffled them? And they thought that curious. 
Why isn't he acting immediately upon this need? Why isn't he going right now? Or remember, they were with him when he when the when the rich ruler came and his his son was ill and he just said, OK, your son's well. He didn't need to be physically present. But they're like, what do you mean you're waiting two days? So it's probably mystifying to the disciples. And just like I said at the beginning, put yourself in the shoes or the sandals of Mary and Martha. Can you imagine how agonizing that would be for them? Why isn't Jesus coming? He should have been here day before yesterday, and we've heard nothing from him. Where is he? Where is he? In John's gospel, there's three, not one story like this. There are three stories where somebody who deeply cares about Jesus and Jesus deeply cares about them, asked him to do something. And you know what his response was? The same thing all three times. He delayed. He delayed. He didn't, he didn't do it right away. So this is the application I want you to make to your own life. God's delays are not God's denials. And sometimes it's hard for us to see the difference, including myself, between a no and a wait. So I would just tell you, if, you're, if you don't get a firm answer, no, then you have to continue to pray and ask. Because sometimes what he's teaching us is patience. And sometimes he's teaching us perseverance in our prayers. And, and, and we need to be diligent with that, unless, like with Paul, Paul asked three times for that thorn in the flesh to be taken away. And God ultimately told him, no, my grace is sufficient for you. And then Paul never prayed about it again. So until you get that definitive no, keep asking. Keep asking. All right, I'm going to read John 7 through 10, but I'm not going to go through any of the explanations until you come back from uh, the break. So after he said that, we're going to wait here two days to his disciples. So two days has passed, and then he says, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the, the Jews sought to just stone you. And you're going there again? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in a day? Now, if anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the dark, he stumbles because the light is not in him. So I'll explain that. It's a little bit uh, uh, vague, what he just said, this metaphor that he just used. So if you give yourselves maybe 30 to 60 seconds and return here, right after the break. I'll see you back here in a few.